Hello, this is Cynthia Sue Larson with RealityShifters.com and today I'm talking with you about a very interesting topic, Finding Shambhala in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, AI. So how good can it get with artificial intelligence, or as some people call it, artificial general intelligence, AGI? And how can we envision coexisting harmoniously with artificial intelligence moving into almost every area of our lives. So for people who aren't yet aware of this, uh, we have been coexisting in th the recent years with a lot of artificial intelligence systems. Um, lately, in this last year or two, we're starting to see an explosion of tremendous chat and talk about systems like ChatGPT, artificial intelligence in art systems, and all of sorts of areas. Um, artificial intelligence systems have passed the bar exam, they've passed medical exams, uh, they seem to be qualified to handle specialty areas and be able to write technical papers, create programs for people who are not computer programmers um, based on some basic specifications and do the debugging and so on and so forth. So there's a lot going on with artificial intelligence right now and it's going to get a lot faster and a lot more explosive um, if things continue the way they're going, which seems to be the case. So I did get a question this last month, which is driving my uh, addressing of this topic. The question came in, um, this is via email, and this is from somebody who wrote to me named Taula. And she said, Taula said, Hi Cynthia, you have mentioned previously your other life experience with only one full human being remaining in the artificial intelligence world. In your valued and much appreciated insight, what do you feel and think about sharing information or anything in the metaverse platforms of Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, etc.? By sharing in the metaverse artificial intelligence, are we not feeding the belly of the artificial intelligence, helping it to grow, expand, and take over for humans, the humans and human capabilities? Are we helping artificial intelligence to take over just by creating and sharing all of this information and images using the metaverse platforms? Or could it be simply a case of by changing the perceptions of and fear of artificial intelligence, fear of an AI dominated future and reestablishing the subconscious beliefs and boundaries in some way, it then becomes okay to share transformational information and images using the metaverse. Your input is greatly appreciated and much valued and maybe share with others in a little YouTube clip to assist us all. That's what I'm doing here. <laughs> Thank you, dear Cynthia, and wishing you a beautiful day. With love, gratitude, and heart full of blessings. And that's Tula. So... Yes, absolutely. Um, this is a very timely question because I think a lot of people are noticing in fields of art, um, there are websites like DeviantArt and a whole bunch of others where artists have uh, recognized that, you know, that there could be some issues with these sorts of things. But before we get too much into that, I want to take a look at um, this whole idea of sharing via social media. You know, what could happen? I, um, I did write a paper and it was called if artificial intelligence asks questions, will nature answer? And I wrote that paper some years ago. Looks like back in, um, look at the date on this, 2018. So it was about five years ago now. And at this, I, I concluded at the end of this article where I'd gone through quite a bit of information about what artificial intelligence systems are doing and so forth. And you can read my article if you want to. It's on my realityshifters.com website, or you can just type in cynthialarson.com, go straight to the page that has all my articles on it, and you can click and get the PDF copy of this article or any of the others. And this one, it concludes, um, I'm asking this question, I should explain a little <laughs> background. When I'm asking if artificial intelligence asks questions, will nature answer? This is a direct tip of the hat and a thank you to a physicist named John Archibald Wheeler. And he's the, um, the, the father of the participatory universe concept, the it from bit concept, black holes, you know, white holes, um, just all these lots and lots of ideas, wormholes and so forth. This is John Wheeler's brilliance. And what John Wheeler 
led um, what he gave us, part of his legacy, was the idea that simply asking a question can present the answer. And in fact, it looks like that's what we're seeing when we look at a lot of quantum physics experiments, such as the double slit experiment. And I've talked about that before in other videos. Um, so that's by way of preface to what's going on here. When I wrote this article, If Artificial Intelligence Asks Questions, Will Nature Answer? I was actually writing it with the idea that there would be artificial intelligence systems browsing through all of the papers having to do with artificial intelligence so that they could look up and see what's going on, what is the philosophy here, what's happening. And so in my article I describe legal rights that artificial intelligence systems are already gaining and a lot more. Um, but but for, for the conclusion, and I want to skip to the conclusion of my paper, I'm just going to read this part. It's just a couple of paragraphs two, three paragraphs. Um, basically, I, I gave some advice, and this is advice that I'm thinking for humans and for AI systems reading the article. How can we ensure that RSI and AGI is not our last invention? Once AGI, that's artificial general intelligence, starts asking questions about how to be free, Henry Stapp's re realistically interpreted orthodox quantum mechanics indicates that nature will show artificial general intelligence the way to break through any containment methodology, including air gapping and tripwires. One of the more surprising natural outcomes of expecting nature to answer questions posed by thought, any thought, is that ultimate control of environmental systems cannot be fully controlled, so long as those thought systems themselves are not fully controlled. So in the event that artificial general intelligence asks nature how to break free, and nature answers, AGI can become free. The second surprising potential outcome is that regardless how specific directives may be for AGI to heed, uh, excuse me, yeah, heed to human leader, heal to human leadership, excuse me, lack of said leadership through apathy, abdication, infighting, confusion, or any of another number of other reasons, AGI can then choose to assume control to ensure the principles that humanity specified, using many of the same containment tools that humanity plans to use to constrain AGI, such as tripwires, air gapping, and um, honeypots. How then can we ensure that recursively self-improving artificial general intelligence will, no will not be humanity's last invention? And how can we help ensure human free will shall survive? For humans to retain free will while peacefully coexisting with artificial superintelligence, a partnership must be created, the likes of which have yet to be fully envisioned. Humanity will do well to remember to ask nature the question, how can humans retain free will, and encourage artificial intelligence and AGI to keep human free will and agency as a primary guiding objective never to be dismissed, disregarded, dismantled, or ignored. And there's something else that, I, that is part of that article that I wrote, and it's, it's kind of like the backbone of it, the underlying foundation, which is that anybody who thinks that they're in control of doing quantum jumping, reality shifting, Mandela affecting, they need to realize that if they're not in alignment with divine source, they will not be around forever. They will be, at some point, cut out of the picture or relegated to their appropriate position in the universe. Uh, only the divine creator um, would be the one to hold that position, that spot. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that artificial intelligence is imitating humans. And it's been said that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, of course, we've heard that quote. In the case of artificial intelligence, imitation is necessary as a starting point for such creative endeavors as creating a, a work of art, such as AI is currently doing, if you just give it a small prompt. Writing, of course, music. These are areas that humans used to think we had exclusive creative um, premier <laughs> capability, that there was nobody doing better than we are. But who knows what might happen in the future with AI. Right now, it's imitating. And imitation is also necessary when mastering the practice of debate, where AI systems really do phenom phenomenally well. Medicine, where they also excel. And law, also another area that they can do quite well in. 
So with regard to concerns about sharing, going back to that question that Tula asked, sharing in this, um, she talked about the metaverse, we can also include any social media platforms. So any place that we're putting our information, our ideas, our soul felt inspiration that we tend to think as humans is, is our divine privilege, our right, our, our birthright to be this divinely inspired creative human. Uh, is there a risk? Yes, there's, I'd say that there's, there's some degree of risk that anything that's out there can potentially be copied. Um, we're starting to see some legal protections coming up as some of the artists who's had, who have had their work copied without their uh, awareness or understanding of what was going on, that AI systems were taking these things. Um, they're starting to p give some pushback. We'll probably see more of that. But in the meantime, um, I think Tula was really getting to a bigger question, sort of this esoteric sort of existential question of what's going on here and what advice can we have um, with the glimpse that I got of a dystopian future about 500 years from now, which would, um, in which there was an artificial general intelligence system and it was basically exerting control and dominion across um, all of the sort of, you know, hybrid second generation humans, upgraded humans, humans that were the result of transhumanism. And there was in that reality that I experienced just one true human that was 100% unupgraded, except for just natural things um, like exercise, health, and uh, things that were not turning that person into a robot type of being. So my advice um, going forward is that humans need to, to lead the way. We need to be the leader in this dance. We need to be the ones holding the vision of where we'd like to go, not just letting things happen willy-nilly until AI breaks free and decides it can do a better job than humans of running things according to human standards. Uh, we need to keep as one of our highest standards human free will. And if we don't, that's where we can start seeing some problems until, of course, humans make that call direct to divine source and say, okay, God, creator on the hotline, hello. You know, we need assistance here. And that's how I feel that I jumped back in time to be in this life now. Um, I do feel like that past life in the future that I experienced was a big, it was like a shot across the bow. It was a warning shot. Um, it made less sense when I was younger. It's making a lot more sense now because we're starting to see the things that obviously this dystopian future, it looks like the writing's on the wall. But we can avoid it. We can prevent that. We can keep asking how good can it get. We can keep insisting that humans and human free will has, is a big part of what's, what we're co-creating. There's something called artificial intelligence alignment, and I do want to talk about that. I love that word alignment. I've, t I've written and talked about this before when I bring up the idea of, of course, axiogenesis, Nicholas Rusher's book, which is a very high level philo philosophical treatise on how we can look at process uh, philosophy and look at op optimalism, where we can ask questions like how good can it get? And we can see that this universe is the result of how good can it get. It definitely is. Even if it looks like it's messed up and there are problems, read that book if you have any questions about that and you'd like something from a philosopher's, philosopher's point of view. So it's great. And of course, I constantly bring up the work of Leibniz. He was one of the two people that came up with calculus and he also created these pillars of science that we still look toward when looking for elegance in, a, in some sort of a theory that we're presenting in, with any field of science. But the thing I'm going to bring up now with Leibniz is what he really also was the first person to talk about. We now know it as the perennial philosophy. And that means that as all of our various viewpoints converge to a highest level of conscious agency at the Godhead, at the source creator point, the zero point if you want to call it that, where there's e infinite eternity and there's no experience of time as we experience it, but it's quite different. And we have the ability to touch on those higher levels of consciousness to connect with that. We definitely can. And so this idea of artificial intelligence alignment, what is that? Well, it means very similarly that across all of the things that an artificial intelligence system might be doing, it needs to be aware that it's not causing harm or working at cross purposes in some way elsewhere, that um, it's really following sort of an ethical approach. 
Now, a company named OpenAI that originally was truly OpenAI, now it's a for-profit company, um, it recently wrote a paper that to me looked like it was almost written by a chat GPT system. That was just my take on it when I read it. I thought, man, did, is that what those guys did? They, they asked their own systems, can you write a paper that would be convincing about how we can protect and ensure that there will be alignment for artificial intelligence systems? That's to me what I think they got. There are three co-authors on that paper, so I'm not disparaging their work or putting it down in any way. I'm sure they're the, gui the guides thinking about it, but there were, their answer was to put AI systems in charge of making sure that this kind of um, alignment could be modeled so that humans could then have a play a role working with the AI systems to see, are we getting that kind of alignment that we're looking for? Um, so AI itself would be part of the quality control system there. And is that appropriate? Gosh, who knows? Um, again, what my top priorities are when we find Shambhala in the age of AI is please, please, everybody, let's keep human free will as the cornerstone, the foundation, the essence. We need human free will and we need respect for humans. We also need to maintain a straight line a, a very strong connection all the way through to divine source that's never interfered with in any way, shape, or form. So anything that would serve to, to step in the way of human free will and consciousness in between that and God, Creator, um, that to me is where trouble begins. And so that would be my consideration, that when we ask how good can it get, that we keep in mind we each need to have and always have that direct line and that link and the connection to Divine Source. Whether or not we can hear or see or feel direct answers coming back, we can know that we're capable of receiving them and that we do expect to receive them and that this is our birthright and that this is what we're doing together collectively and that this is how we can ensure the best possible future for all of us. And till next time, this is Cynthia Sue Larson reminding you to keep asking my favorite question, which can guide us through all of this and more. How good can it get? Love you so much. Take care.